other tidbits of info. Perfect. So, Perfect. Um, so Catherine Mayberry is a faculty research assistant at the Horowitz Center for Health Literacy at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Dr. Mayberry has expertise in health literacy, behavioral health education, and project management. Her research and practice work at the Horowitz Center have focused on increasing the oral health literacy of low-income pregnant women and providers to improve the oral health of women and children. She recently completed work on a federally funded project to increase medical dental integration and health literacy in federally qualified health centers in Maryland, Virginia, Washington, DC, and New York. She is currently working on multiple projects to teach healthcare providers and staff about health literacy, clear communication practices, and organizational health literacy. Her joy is teaching an undergraduate course in health literacy for community health and pre-professional students. So welcome, Dr. Mayberry. Um, I know you prefer Catherine, you said, yeah. and I have had the pleasure of hearing your information before and just found it so, so informative. So thank you for being here today. Great. Well, I'm delighted to be here and, um, you know, welcome everybody. So I'm going to take here. just for um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you're not on mute, would you mute yourself? Thanks so much. Okay, perfect. Um, so we're going to talk about organizational health literacy. So I put together, I don't know, six or seven slides to kind of give you some background in that. Um, and then we'll talk about the medical dental integration project that I worked on, a HRSA funded project, a demonstration project that's actually still ongoing. And then I'll talk about um, a little bit about a COVID project that is a federally funded project as well to focus in on communicating with the communities. It, it is related to COVID, but there is an organizational health literacy component. So it's a way to think of that. And we do a fair amount of this work in the center, um, you know, working with organizations to think about how they present information and the barriers to access that they may inadvertently cause. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen here and go through that. So one quick sec. And while you are doing that, Catherine, I'm just going to go ahead and ask everybody to introduce yourself in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, with your name and your organization so that we can all see that as well. So, Okay, so you can see my slides with the Horowitz Center there? Just yes, we sure. can. Yep. Before, before I head down, <laughs> head down the path and people can't. So um, I'm going to talk about something called organizational health literacy. Um, it is the policies and practices that organizations implement that can make it easier for patients or clients, because it's not always a health center or a dental center, to find, understand, and use health information. Um, and so that and it, it helps them engage in the process of care and ultimately manage their health. And the reason that we have all these images on the front here is that these are the types of things that we look at in an organizational assessment. So we look at the environment, like where people are welcome. We look at plain language, which is a huge part of communication, both written and oral. We look at consent forms. We look at websites. We assess the phone system. And then we look at like written material. So there's many different parts when we think of organizational health literacy. And so, um, and the reason we wanna talk about health literacy is we want organizations to build this capacity. So often we work on projects, right? Grant funded projects and we come in and we do some work, but then we want you know, to teach people how to do this and, or at least begin this process and provide different resources so that people you know, understand this and can think about their organization and approach that they might want. And at the end, I will um, provide a resource that's related to oral health literacy, um, organizational health literacy, and it comes out of California, a project that they did out there. So um, the, you know, my background, as um, Jane mentioned, is that I have worked on um, a couple big projects. One, about 10 years ago, um, I worked with a woman named Dr. Alice Horowitz, 
who founded our center here at the University of Maryland, a center for health literacy. She is was a dental hygienist, health educator, and then was a senior scientist at NIH. And when she retired, she started this center for health literacy. And she was very focused on oral health literacy because she wanted to be able to you know, help parents raise children with no cavities. And so one of the things that we did as part of that project, it was when I first started working for her, is we went to all of the publicly um, funded, so federally qualified health centers and county and community health centers and did these types of organizational assessments and gave feedback. And then we um, most recently were working together on a project funded by HRSA called NOE, the Network of um, Oral Health Integration in the Maternal and Child um, Safety Net System. So we went to um, different partners. So those were the four, three states in Washington, DC and work with their um, fairly qualified health centers. And one part of that project was the medical and dental integration of um, the medical and dental records and then the processes and then assessing just things outside of just the medical records themselves that could present barriers like trying to take that holistic view of organizational health literacy. So um, Dr. Horowitz retired in June. And so the project is going on for another two years, one or two years, I can't remember, but I left, I went out of that. Um, and now I'm just focusing in um, on uh, medical providers in particular, their communication, like in, or, in organizations. So anyway, so that's it. So um, when we think of organizational health literacy, a lot of it comes from the medical field, but it can apply to dental organizations and it can apply to health departments and partner organizations. And we've done this work with all of them. So um, in this session, like I said, I'm gonna talk about what organizational health literacy is. And then we'll talk about a tool or a process that we use called um, an environmental scan or assessment. And then we'll think about like how you all might be able to use this. So um, the definition of health literacy, most people are familiar with the first part, which is that individual part, right? But what people might be less familiar with is what we call organizational health literacy. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, has a, a group, a, a working group that comes up with the healthy people objectives. These are our nation's health objectives. They do this every 10 years. They publish them every 10 years. So the work starts a year or two before. So the definition for health literacy started out for the first 20 years. The first time it was published was in 2000. And it was updated in 2010 and 2020. So for health, the um, Healthy People 2030, so that's where we want to be in 10 years, um, the uh, team that was um, look at revising the definition added in organizational health literacy, just acknowledging that there are many things beyond an individual's control that we want to account for. It's like this balance, right? We've got individual skills and we've got organizational factors. And so health literacy is sort of that nexus in between. So, you know, there is this um, idea that organizations, you know, can support individuals in um, getting access to that information. So the key takeaway of like the presentation, if you remember anything, is that the environmental characteristics of a healthcare organization can shape the experiences and the actions whether it's patients, visitors, it can be the staff and providers that work there, right? And affect then ultimately the access to information, care and services. And we'll talk about what those things are, but just the environment that you go into affects how healthcare is delivered. And the good news is, is organizations can take an approach to implement policies and practices that really minimize these barriers and support patients. And we'll give, I'll give you some details around what that means. So just to kind of back up, we often think like, oh, a person's coming in for a dental appointment and they just need to show up, right? But we often forget of the, all the types of things that they might need to do before they come in, right? So they might need to find and understand health information, you know, just to be able to describe their problem, to describe their child's problem, um, to find the clinic, right? To find, find resources and services. They have to be able to go out and evaluate. 
We often ask them to, um, we give them complicated language or printed forms with test results or um, calculating dosages for any type of medicine. So that um, in general applies a little more to medicine than dentistry, but you can require medicine, right, to manage an oral health condition. So we expect them to be able to do that. Um, we expect them to understand relative risks and benefits. If we talk about a procedure, you know, we need to couch that in terms of you can do A, B, and you could C, or you could do nothing. And what are those risks and benefits? And a person's ability to understand risk will, you know, affect their decision that they make. They need to be able to communicate with healthcare providers. Like we expect people to provide us with the information when they come in very succinctly. We have this expectation that they can communicate like we do, right? Like my symptoms are, but a lot of people, they don't ha have a healthcare context or background. So they don't even really know how to think about and report their symptoms. Like if you go through life and you have different conditions, you learn to sort of log this first, you know, I first, it's first started feeling this way at this point. And you, you are able to note that and provide that information. But for a lot of people, the first time you say, you know, what's your pain scale on one to 10, if you've never thought of that question, like, you know, what is it really? We, we assume many things. And then we expect people to be able to navigate a healthcare system. And I know from here in Maryland, and I can't speak for Minnesota, but for individuals who are low income and they're trying to navigate the um, Medicaid system or uh, low cost or free clinics, it can be really hard just finding information, getting connected, getting um, getting an appointment, you know, if people are going to apply for Medicaid, all the paperwork we expect. So we just expect people to do a lot of things to come to our system of care. So we just want um, providers to really think about those things. So when we think about organizational health literacy, we think about it in these five different um, buckets, if you will, the, the policies, practices, navigation, you know, culture and language and communication. So when we think about um, policies, it could be a policy um, that requires, um, if we're going to be a more health literate organization, it could be that when we do customer sat patient satisfaction surveys or experience surveys, that there's a question on there about my provider communicated in a way I understand. Um, it could be like higher up, a policy could be that health literacy is incorporated in your mission uh, statement, right? It, you know, so it, the policies can vary. It could be everything from, um, you know, do you have a patient family advisory council that gives you guidance and feedback on the materials and your providers? We think about organizational practices. It could be things like having um, print materials that are evaluated. Before you hand them out, are they evaluated for low literacy audiences? The other thing is uh, nowadays we often see um, uh, electronic health records and people, you know, purchase a product that provides the health education materials, but who's actually gone through and assessed those. So when Dr. Horowitz and I were working on the HRSA project, we, um, a lot of the providers use a certain system and they used another system for their health materials. And the information that was generated was frankly terrible. It was written at like a 13th grade level. The, um, there were very few images and it wasn't about behaviors. It was a lot of epidemiological data, like this many people have the disease. So they, the materials, you know, so that people can check off, yes, oh yes, we have health materials and we can print them, but the materials themselves weren't great. So having, you know, somebody who's looking at those types of things, it could be the hours that you're open, right? Um, so that's what we look at when we look at some of the practices. When we think of navigation, it could be people coming into a clinic. So do they have to um, navigate a kiosk? Are there people that are there to support them? Are the signs, and this is really important if you're in a medical facility or a large campus, is how people get around. People are showing up and they're already stressed out. For some people, just simply going to the doctor or the dentist is like, they wake up and they're stressed out, right? So if they come in and they can't navigate because maybe the signage isn't in plain language, my favorite is um, nephrology department, right? Mm -hmm. The nephrologists know exactly where the nephrology department is and what it is, but people don't know 
And we know from stories that people can't find what they want and they walk right out the building and they just don't, you sometimes wonder why people don't follow through on referrals, right? So we really want to think about the signs and the words and how welcoming we are. And that's just one part of navigation. And navigation could be your website. It could be your phone system. Um, you know, part of the assessments that we do around the phone system is we look at how many options. So if your phone tree has nine options, right? Like when I call in, I was actually calling places, I was calling medical offices today for something and to leave a message, right? And like, I have a pen out going, you know, like I'm listening through like the nine options. A couple of the practices had nine options and I'm writing them down to figure out which is the best one for me, right? I'm trying to reach the practice manager. So for a lot of people, that's just overwhelming, right? Like, was that three or two, right? Or do I hit zero? So we need to really think about those types of things. Um, culture and language. So do you um, provide materials that um, members of your patient or community um, population understand? Are they like here in this area, right? We need materials in languages other than English. So we really want to think about that. And um, we also want to think about the culture. So I was working up in uh, Baltimore about a year and a half ago in a community engagement clinic center where interprofessional groups of students, so students from medicine and social work and dentistry and law come in and they see people, we call them neighbors, not um, clients, um, come in for assistance. It's often navigating, right, and figuring things out. And so one of the things that they, uh, students have to do is go through like a several hour course. And one component of that is who is our patient demographic? Who is the population we're serving? And what are their cultures and traditions? Because a lot of students are coming from all over the US to go to school there, whether it's medical or dental, and they may not um, have experience with uh, minority populations, right? So that's something to consider as well. And then communication. So what language do we use, do providers use when they talk um, to individuals, your coalition members? What types of words do we use? And jargon is probably one of the biggest things. You know, jargon really helps when we're communicating among um, similar professionals, right? But when we're talking to people who aren't from our group, and just think about when people talk about technology or IT, that's an example where, you know, um, you can you can have a problem with your computer and you walk into the computer, um, you know, IT uh, group and they start speaking their technical language and you're just like, just please fix it, right? And I think that's often how patients might feel about that. So um, we use something. So we have like all these different factors in organizations. And so we use something called an environmental scan. And this comes from, and let me just go back to my reference, is a lot of this work, um, and the tools that we were using here in the Horowitz Center were based on work by Dr. Rima Rudd and colleagues. She was at Harvard. I think she retired last year. And she worked for over 20 years with um, adult literacy patients and individuals with low literacy and how they experience the health center. So she came up with a tool that has a series of assessments that we either use in their um, original format, or we tweak them for the project that we're working on. So um, this is where, you know, a lot of this work comes from, and this is where um, we think about these scans. So um, this is what we did um, on both the projects, the HRSA project and the Maryland project, is we went out and we had these different types of assessments, and um, we went out and took a look at them. And the whole point that we do it is we want to understand what facilitates or creates barriers to patients or clients when they're visiting, you know, it could be the health department, it could be, um, you know, like United Way, like services, right, as well as the health centers and dental clinics. And then the, the real issue here is that often, you know, people that work in these organizations, they're just unaware of the barriers that people encounter. So this is why we do this. We're not doing it to point out flaws, but we're looking at it as a way to better support the individuals that we serve. So I'm going to show you um, uh, <laughs> uh, our process. This was our process model when we worked on the, Hor on the um, HRSA project and we uh, tweaked it a bit from the one that we had done on the dental project. 
So we broke this down and this was pre-COVID because we did not go on site during COVID, but we broke it down into three different areas of tasks. And the first was this pre-assessment. So how it would work on the HRSA project is um, we had our primary contractor, they were an organization called Health Efficient out of uh, New York, and they would make an introduction after they had been working with the team for anywhere from six months to a year on the medical dental record integration. And then they would make an introduction to whoever their team leads were. And the team leads could be the dentist, the medical provider, like often pediatric provider, or it could be um, staff, like an office manager, it just really varied by project. And so as that we'd make this introduction and we would set up and do sort of this overview conversation, like 15, 20 minutes, and then tell them what we would need. And before we actually had that conversation, I would go out and assess their website. And I was looking for things like, you know, what kinds of services do they provide? Who's their patient population? Do they have any information about oral health out there? So when we did this project 10 years ago in Maryland, there was a fair amount of oral health education information on the websites, but there's very, people don't put that much health information uh, education out there um, and maybe it's in the portals, but we, we, we didn't find any websites with it. And then we just went through some basic, there are tools that we use to assess like the navigation of the, how the web system's designed. And then we were always looking for plain language. And then we also called in and, you know, navigated the phone system. I would call during the day. I would call during the night just to kind of see what the emergency, um, you know, like there are the after hours was. Um, during the day when I called, I would often say during COVID, you know, I'm calling because you can't just call in and hang up, you know, once you get them. So I would say, you know, I've got a friend who's going to the office for the first time and I want to know the COVID protocol, right? Or like, I've got a friend who's just moved into the area and they want to make an appointment. What are your policies? Like, you know, like that kind of thing, just to have a minor interaction with the staff. So um, we looked at the phone and then we um, did interviews, 30 minute interviews, um, semi-structured with the medical and dental um, um, managers. And what we were really trying to find out was what was their approach to oral health? What were their policies? Did they see pregnant women? Did they provide pregnant women with oral health? education? Did they make sure that they were uh, referred to a dentist or, you know, did you ask that, you know, have you seen a dentist? And then we talked to the dental providers to find out, you know, their policies and uh, procedures. And it could be things like if you call in for an initial appointment, how long before you're seen? And sometimes it was one week and sometimes it was three or four or five, six months, right? So we're just trying to, you know, understand those issues because you can use that to bubble it up into other policies and requests for funding if, if, you know, people aren't seen. We asked about interpretation services and how well the medical and dental records were integrated. We also looked at their, um, sometimes their community support. So did they work with WIC? Did they work with Head Start? Did they work in the schools? Because we're interested in the oral health of pregnant women, young children, and then children in schools, right? And our project was very focused on zero to 42 months. So really first three and a half years of life there. So those were the types of things that, and we had, um, you know, we tweaked that along the way. We had developed that uh, survey instrument um, like 10 years ago and then modified it for this project. And then we used to go on site. So we would do, we would show up and walk and figure out, you know, like if we're in downtown Baltimore, you know, where do people park? Is there signage, right? Uh, sometimes dental clinics are in um, public health facilities and there's no sign out, uh, out on the outside of the building. So how would people find that, right? And then we would walk through the building itself looking for, you know, security. Are they friendly and welcoming? It can be very scary um, to go into a health center and some of them in Baltimore do have security guards and they need them. Um, but that can be very intimidating for people. We looked at the signage and then we walked through um, the lobbies and the operatories and the clinics and we're noting um, people, it's captive audience, right? You're, you're in a chair, like, do they have oral health information there? Is it in the lobby? Do they have videos playing? These are all things 
that um, can support patients and provide health information. And then while we were there, we would actually collect a, a series of oral health materials um, and then go through and do um, different types of assessments. These are health literacy assessments. And so we would look at the pamphlets, the educational materials, and we would also look at the um, uh, consent forms in particular, and we would typically rewrite a form using plain language, because a lot of times you end up with language here to, for, whereby, right? Well, you know, like why legal has to put those words in, right? You know, it's not, necess it's not necessary. And then um, we would do patient surveys. And so in the patients, we were assessing their knowledge of oral health. So some very basic questions like the, the, for moms, um, what's an early sign of tooth decay? What is fluor? Do you know what fluoride is? Do you know how, you know, what it's used for? Like, what is its purpose, right? And then we would also assess, um, the, you know, like, you know, do your providers speak to you in language that you understand? So some communication practices, so about 20 questions. And then we would assess providers, their knowledge of communication practices, um, you know, in communicating with patients. These are questions that often show up if you're familiar with the CAPS, the consumer assessment, you know, provider surveys that ask if you, especially if you've ever had a relative that's been to a doctor recently, and definitely if you have um, someone, you know, ha who has Medicare insurance, they will often send surveys that will ask you, you know, did your provider communicate in a way that you understood? Did they take enough time with you? So we have a few questions there. And then we would pull all this together and provide a report. And from that report, um, we would make recommendations. And so on the HRSA project, some of our centers came back to us after we provided the report and they had an Excel spreadsheet. It was great. And they said, here's what we are addressing right now. Here's what we'll do longer term. And here's what we'll never do just because of the, our funding, our structure, that type of thing. So it was just a way for them to become more patient, customer centered. So I wanna talk about just briefly before I stop here and open up the conversation. Um, so our Baltimore City Health Department, we have a COVID-19 project. And so we're just beginning to work with um, organizations. So we have uh, pediatric providers, we have uh, the health department, we have individuals from the schools, we have um, a couple community service providers. And um, so we're meeting with them and the types of things that we're gonna talk about, we're just beginning this work, is deconstructing a task. So as I mentioned early on, we often expect people to show up and um, you know be present. And if you think about, let's say somebody who has diabetes this is a more complex one, they have to think about like, maybe you've asked them to keep a log. Um, maybe they need to bring the, all their medicines with them. They have to re remember the appointment. And then after the appointment, if you make a referral, they have to figure out, figure out how to navigate that. So we take down all these steps that, you know, they have to have transportation to the appointments. They have to have childcare. That's all those things that go on behind the scenes before you can show up, right? We also do those first impressions, walking assessments in larger facilities. Um, you can do those in a couple ways. You can have people have a piece of paper or a tablet and note things as, as you, you say, you're going into this hospital and you're going to go to a certain department and they note the signage, they note things that are helpful. Um, so that's one way to do it. The other is you walk with them and they give you their impressions of, you know, why are you turning right here? What is the signage telling you, right? So it's, it's you can do that in one of two ways. You, we've got a whole series out of Dr. Rudd's um, HLE2 about the website and phone system. And then we um, were working with them. They most many organizations create health materials. So we want them to understand we can't train them to be communication experts, but we can go through and talk about plain language or how to organize the content. So we're gonna we're gonna pick one or two for each organization so that once this project ends later this year, the organizations will, you know, have built some capacity for health literacy. So that is the end of um, what, you know, I'm going to talk about here today. So these articles are around um, organizational health literacy. And I can, towards the end, if you want, share something from California 
around oral health, organizational health literacy. So let me stop sharing here and you know, ask what kinds of questions do you have? So you're welcome to put them in the chat or you're welcome to just ask me, unmute and ask. <laughs> Yeah, and if you feel more comfortable putting them in the chat, we'll read, Jane or I will read them. Otherwise, um, yeah, and thank you so much. And I think I think we'd love to hear about the the oral health project that you mentioned. I think that would be right. That would be really interesting. But yeah, let's see. Um did you say that you had some resources that you could share with us? Um I have one and I okay. think um let me just do a quick share and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, I just think it's so interesting, the whole concept, because, you know, even as people myself, okay, I'm not an oral health professional, but I work a lot with oral health. And so I just went to my dental appointment the other day and he was talking about you know, a couple of things with my teeth. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the the language that he was using just wasn't something I was familiar with. And so I am a person who can say to him, okay, what exactly does that mean? You know, in terms of what what's wrong with my tooth? And And he's, you know, he made a comment that well, quite honestly, what that means is that it's probably as good as it's going to get. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, okay, well, that's really easy for me to understand. So why use all that other mumbo jumbo language that, right. you know, right. but, but he's a professional too. So, right. right. Um, yeah. But he has to communicate. Like we really firmly believe here in the Center for Health Literacy that patients have a right to health information that they can understand and use to act on to change behaviors, mm -hmm. right? And when you don't understand information, then you can't make an informed decision. And that means that if you can't take your medicines correctly, you can't take an antibiotic correctly, you can't take your high blood pressure, diabetes, like whatever medicine it is, um, then at best, you're not going to get worse, right? But you can, you, there's real consequences to this. So I'm going to put this link in the chat, but this is out of um, the California Department of Health, the Office of Oral Health, and they had received a grant some years ago, an oral health literacy grant, and they did a lot of work. But one of the things that they created was this toolkit um, about oral health literacy and practice. And it's really written in um, plain language, like the different types of assessments, the approach, whether you want to um, just deal with like one issue, like maybe we're really going to focus on jargon, or if you want to like take a long-term organizational approach, which could take some years. And then, so it's written really clearly. It talks about how a uh, dental practice, right, can adopt health literacy. So it's a great resource. I'm going to stop sharing and just put wow. that into the chat. So everybody has it. That's a, that's a great resource for us. It is. It really, it's, um, you know, it's a great Thank toolkit you. and it's a way for you to, like I said, think about one specific thing. And often, so um, when I teach health literacy to my students and they are future um, health professionals, so pre-dental, pre-medical, and they're also, it's a combined class with our behavioral and community health department here. So these are folks that are going to implement community-based programs, health interventions, so they're in the class together and they're going to ultimately, you know, form some sort of interprofessional team in their lives. There's a really good chance that they'll be working with individuals. So we do talk about ways that organizations and programs, right? Like if you're, if you're a public health department or you're part of a nonprofit, you know, the Alzheimer's Association, the Maryland Dental Action Coalition, right? And you're putting out oral health information, you want people to understand it. And there's things that you can do and it can be one step or it can be step back and take a broader approach. But often when people start this work, they begin with one person or one department, you know, beginning mm -hmm. to take a look at maybe it's our health education materials, right? And then when they see that it works and it improves things, then they sometimes step back and take an even, you know, um, broader view of organizational sure. health literacy. Dr. Rose, did you have a question? No, I'm fine. Thank you. 
Okay, I saw you went off mute there. So, um, okay. I think what I'll do, Nancy, is take that resource and yeah. share. I'll I'll send that to you, but I'll also send that out to some of our dental providers just to, mm -hmm. you know, take snips of it. And that's a for me as a way that I will apply and mm -hmm. use that information to spread the word about that too. Yeah, so. it's a, it's a it's a fabulous resource, and it's written. It's so what I love about health literacy is like we try to embody this in everything we do right mm -hmm. so when we create um when i create my lectures for students when i write manuscripts when i write emails i try to be really clear so that people can understand they don't have to dig through information right like it, it, it you know a lot of times you can have miscommunication and the other piece you know that i often talk to my students about is you know, providers should confirm your understanding. We often mm -hmm. say that's using teach back. And I tell the students, because, you know, we developed this course for two reasons. One was so that students, they're, you know, they're um, transitioning into managing their own health care. So it's like, you can be an advocate for yourself. So if your provider does not teach back, you turn around and teach back. And you can say, okay, you know, is your, you know, in, in the meeting, I just want to be clear that I understood you as opposed mm -hmm. to the provider saying, I want to be clear. I provided clear information that you understand, right. That I was clear in the information and directions I gave and the guidance that you can do that. And what's really interesting is, you know, it, it is a pretty hilarious thing here in the office. We're a small team, but we all use this, right? Like I go into my boss's office to have a conversation about something that she wants me to do. And I never leave before going, okay, so just to make sure I'm clear, <laughs> we all use that, right? Like you want me to do A, B, C, and D. And sometimes I don't need to do C or I need to do F, right? But it just, it, it then can kind of seep into other parts, other parts of your life, right? Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> this is so interesting. Um, wonderful. Any Anything that anyone wants to share? Any questions? Um, all right. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, we're working on a project, a COVID project. It is out of a county here in Maryland called Frederick. Um, mostly rural, but the city of Frederick, you know, has a majority of the population. And so this project was designed um, to reach minority populations using a partner um, called the Asian American Center of Frederick. And because, you know, there was a real disparity in health information getting out to different um, populations, right? And especially uh, uh, groups who English is not the first language. Mm -hmm. So we used community health workers to go out and often just you know, in Medicare, Medicaid populations, we often use navigators or community health workers to help people. And so, you know, we were working with them to provide this information and connect with the group. So we were training them, you know, in um, how to speak about COVID. So, but, you know, COVID is just in my mind, another health topic. So how to provide the most critical information and then how to connect them two services, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they found, so the hospital, the, the main hospital there in Frederick, they did an organizational assessment to figure out how to better support community health workers who are calling in for patients. So if somebody's, or a client, right? So if somebody, if a community health worker is calling in and they have to go through the, the phone system, which can be overburdened, mm -hmm. like figuring out a way to better facilitate somebody whose support services would so be United Way. If you have people that are navigating for others, like helping people to navigate more smoothly to serve people. So that was like the impetus. And then they're also just revisiting how their call center works to make it more efficient for people, mm -hmm. right? Um, for the dental clinics, like a big issue often is, um, so uh, if people are lucky, they can have medical and dental offices co-located, right? Because we know that that makes a big difference if someone's um, coming in and um, say it's a pregnant woman and she hasn't been to the dentist in a while. And here in Maryland, um, women only received Medicaid benefits when they were pregnant. 
up until like the last year and a half, like, like in, it's changed, but it used to be women had a very good benefit while they were pregnant. So we would really try to push them to get in, to have their, uh, you know, oral health, their teeth taken care of so that they would transmit less bacteria to their infant when it was born. Um, but the day that they delivered their Medicaid dental benefit went away. So um, over the last several years, they pushed and it was 60 days, but it's like, you know, let's be really serious. Like who's going to get out of bed, you know, especially first time moms and go to the dentist. Right. But now it's a year. So we work, you know, our policy group, the Maryland Dental Action Coalition, they have a great website and they've done a lot of advocacy and work with the legislators to um, change some of the um, practices. So anyway, um, we were reaching out, you know, as part of the project, like trying to make women aware that they could get dental care here, right? So there were materials related to that. Um, so in as part of the Maryland evaluation, because every one of those four states, like DC and the three states, every one of them has different Medicaid rules, right? Around uh, for low income women, which is just, it gets really crazy. But here in Maryland, um, we had a couple FQHCs where medicine and dental are co-located, which makes it easier. And they really institute a, a couple policies that supported um, women getting to the dentist. So the first was um, having a warm handoff. So somebody um, is in the office and so you, they could call and the, the dental hygienist or staff member could come over and they could work to book an appointment. So that was that was a really big piece of it because if you just tell somebody, you know, like make an appointment later, you know, the chances are they decrease, right? It's harder. The other thing is they ended up having some slots and this is always very, very, very difficult to manage, but they kept some same day slots and um, in their appointment um, books so that um, it was that was for emergencies as well as if somebody was able to do an appointment. But having that handoff, and then often we don't necessarily have what we call a closed loop referral, right? So you refer them, and then that's that's in the medical record. But how do you know other than when they come back in for another appointment? Like a lot of times there wasn't a note in the medical record to re ask them about, you know, did you see the dentist um, or, you know, just following up because it is really important for, you know, women to have their oral health cared for, for many reasons, right? Because if we don't value the pregnant women's and the young moms or the older moms, you know, oral health, it may not be as much of a priority for, you know, for yeah. they, they see it as not a high priority. So they may not prioritize it in their children. Right. So I have a question for our audience in that, um, what kinds of strategies do all of you use within your organizations with the health literacy part of things? Um, do you have specific programs or policies or protocols that you use that help to ensure that whatever information is being distributed, whether medical or dental, is at a good, you know, a good reading level if it's written information? Um, particularly, you know, across all languages too. So that's another question, mm. you know, re with regard to health literacy. Um, <clears throat> I I know every once in a while I get a I get something written, and people will ask, "What do you think of this?" And if it's hard for me to understand, not that I'm a genius by any means, but that you know, it's probably hard for some others to understand too. So mm. I'm curious to hear from our audience today what kinds of practices you have within your respective organizations. We have a quiet group today. Nathan. We have a very quiet group today. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's February 1st and we all have a little bit of lack of vitamin D absorption, I think, here in Minnesota. Absolutely. <laughs> and if the sun doesn't come out for a while, it makes it even more difficult those days when you get up and right. it's it gray, 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 gray. No comments, no input today. Okay, well. I just want to say it's Colleen Brickle from Normandale Community College. Thank you, this is great information. Um, 
And I can see a couple, I see um, Andy on it. And I remember for a class um, at Metropolitan State for the Advanced Health Therapy Program that I developed. And we, and I had talked with Dr. Horowitz and she was really excited about dental therapy having. Yes. It. to see Andy still on and it moving forward. And just in dental hygiene, um, it, it is wonderful and absolutely necessary. This is a great, I'm glad Nancy's doing this and the, um, the resource you put in there again. And I know Claire, Who's on here too feels the same way. This is just absolutely necessary to have this in our um, all our dental programs. Um, yep. Thank you. And well, you're welcome. And you know, Dr. Horowitz is, um, still is. She's not here, but she still works on a million different grants and um, projects. Right? She'll we um, she, she'll just work. You know, until until she exits this planet. <laughs> she's she's always working on stuff, and she is a huge. Um, proponent of the what the, you know the mid tier or the um, um, dental um, therapist program, right? We're hoping for more of those across the U.S. And um, we need to think about you know even for dental therapists, right? If they're going to be communicating the kinds of materials that we arm them with to help them um, provide this information to people, because that will be their contact, right? It's one of the reasons why it's really important because um, we do studies, you know, national studies of who people trust and where they get their health information from. And it is from their providers. So um, we want to provide, you know, we want like when people have that face, that one-on-one -on -one face to face, we want to arm them with tools that they can, you know, give people. Yeah, Dan Rose here, I know you can hear me there or not. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, uh, of course, left Minnesota and came down here and came into an entirely different environment. But uh, I have been advocating, when you mentioned dental therapists, I've been really encouraging people, look at the Minnesota model. Yeah. You know, they keep looking, well, I shouldn't, I, I don't make, I mean that sound pejorative, but it seems like the emphasis is focusing on what they did in Washington and Alaska, which is fine, you know, dental nurses and that. What is so positive about the Minnesota, I think, uh, uh, model, is that uh, it's really an, an enhancement of the dental hygiene position because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. those individuals are trained during their hygiene education to do just what you're talking about, to communicate with people. <laughs> and uh, I, I just I just think the dental therapy model uh, uh, included in a dental hygiene program is really the way to go. Yeah. And, you know, it, you know, um, dentists, just like primary care providers, there's shortages all across the U.S., right? Yeah. Um, and so we need to think about other ways to provide care. And if you think back like 20 years ago, um, people were, you know, like nurse practitioners, right? Like, like we're extending that model of care. Not everybody needs to see um, an MD when they go, when, when they go to a doctor, right? There are other um, members of the care team, right? And so I think we really need to think about that from a from a dentistry perspective. And then training, you know, dental therapists and hygienists is fabulous because their job, they, they get a lot more training in communication and establishing mm -hmm. rapport. And that's really important. And that's where this um, plain language and teach back, right? We know that dental hygienists do a lot of that work, right? That they mm -hmm. are really... Um, the ones who provide the information on how to care for the child's teeth, how to care for their teeth. So yeah, we want to provide them the tools to do that. Well, the the other area you talk about communication and, and is that I'm discovering is that there isn't there has not been a lot of communication between the primary care physicians, the primary care dentist, and the uh, behavioral health people, which yeah. is kind of the uh, the bottom rung coalition that that you yeah. would look at. And um, I, I don't know what, if, if you've done any work with that or not, but I'm finding to get to get a uh, a therapist and a physician and a dentist in the same room, and uh, you don't always speak the same language. And, you and you definitely just, don't. What we, we see, therapy. yeah, what we see, um, you know, federal, <clears throat> excuse me, federally qualified health centers are. Um, I've noticed just from like doing the website assessments and looking at the services of the FQHCs here in um, DC, Maryland, um, New York, uh, and Virginia is many, many, uh, many of them have uh, behavioral health services. That's been something that's been mm -hmm. added on, right? And 
um, I think we've realized that there's been crises. And so, you know, services are still in short supply, but at least there are services. So a lot of the provide, like the organizations that we assessed did have referrals and connections to try and connect them. Now, did they all sit down together? I don't know. I know that there was often, you know, there's like the medical huddles. We would talk to the medical directors and there would be medical huddles. And then they would loop in the dental directors, not to all morning huddles, but some of them to try and, and make that integration. And part of the issue, you know, I have a fabulous primary care doctor, but the man has never asked me about my teeth, right? Like I, I love everything else about him, but, you know, as a person from oral health. So, you know, if people don't um, talk about this, right? If they don't raise questions and they don't make those referrals and those connections and emphasize it's really important, it's a lost opportunity. So Nancy? Yeah, I, thank you for this. I wanted to say, I, I wanted to reiterate this point that you made about um, health literacy in terms of professionals talking to professionals. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. And then um, Connie Bai shared something in the chat and I won't put you on the spot, Connie, but um, no, I was I was raising my hand. Oh, good. Okay, I didn't see it. Yeah, I always yeah. talk. You know that. No, it's good because um, if it's in my brain, it comes out. That's <laughs> so. Anyway, um, the Minnesota Health Literacy Partnership <laughs> does meet monthly virtually, and um, there is a lot of participation and networking there amongst the health plans. Oh, great! But they also um, spo sponsored. Um, a um, day-long conference recently that was all virtual and I believe it's recorded I believe it's available the recording okay. is available I'll now check. and they had a nice wide variety of topics and really good feedback um, for future planning um, but if people want to become more involved that's a great place to go and that website has PowerPoints ready to go and all kinds of resources that you can use within your organizations as well. Mm -hmm. I was going to say um, yeah. in your neighborhood, <laughs> Wisconsin yeah. has a very active yeah. health literacy coalition as well. So they have, um, they have resources on their website. I'm always out there looking for stuff, you know, for my students. Mm -hmm. So like just these health literacy coalitions are really important. And the Maryland Dental Action Coalition um, what they have is information about some of the policy work, and I'll get that and put uh, drop that into the link here. Um, Great. You know, just because there are a lot of people doing a lot of work, and sometimes it's overlapping, and sometimes you can leverage. Or, like one of the things on this medical dental integration project is we had um, a person from each team that was looking at the legislation and and the way that services were structured, so that they could figure out, well, if the state is doing, if New York is doing this, maybe we could use that model to change our legislation, right? Like being able to look at the services yeah. and things like that, like looking at what other states are doing and, you know, trying to um, leverage that or use their expertise can be really helpful. Nancy, um, I'm going to have, I have another meeting I've got to yeah. get to. Yes, so it's so great to see you. you. And thank you, Kathy, for uh, thank you. the presentation. It just kind of stirs up the mind a little bit. So yeah. Great. That's, that was, that was what I was here for. Day. Thank you for coming. So <laughs> bye, Dr. Just, Rose. Yeah, bye. And um, put one more thing in the chat yeah. before we wind up here. And Catherine, you mentioned, um, I think it was you that mentioned, you know, that you met some people and they brought health literacy kind of into your world. And um, for me, it was first Connie by... Um, cause Connie was really, um, was working closely with the Minnesota health literacy partnership. And then Dr. Jan Janelle Lamont, who's with the university of Minnesota, she was with MDH. You two okay. kind of championed it for me. And then we brought it into the coalition. Right. Which is, uh, coalitions are, they're just such, you know, we do a lot of our health literacy work around the state with the health coalitions, because you have partners from all different areas, right? Yeah. Like we have multiple, we call them local health improvement coalitions. So we have multiple coalitions that we work with and we're looking, we've over the last four years, we've been looking to increase their health literacy mm -hmm. capabilities. So we leverage those often when we're looking for, you know, any type of support or um, trying to uh, engage more with the communities. We often work with the, the health coalitions. 
Yeah, that's the beauty of coalitions, <laughs> right? We love that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are almost out of time. Okay. And um, Dr. Mayberry, Catherine, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for the presentation and the resources. We love the resources. Jane, I know you you brought Dr. Mayberry to us, so I want you to, any yes, words? Yes, thank you. It was oh. wonderful to hear it again. And thank you, like Nancy said, thank you for the resources. We will certainly use them and share them. Um, right. And if you you know about us now and we know about you and if yes, there's ever so anything else that- Please do. Can, okay, Please wonderful. reach out, you know, and anybody's welcome to reach out and, you know, if they have questions or other additional resources. So thank you. Do you mind putting your contact info in the chat? Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, It'd be great. And, and we are going to have this recorded. Um, so if someone's listening and they didn't get the chat, just get a hold of me and we'll connect you. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Stay warm, Bye. everyone. <laughs>